Hello, and welcome to our webinar for faith. This week, we're going to be discussing the Passover, and it's some interesting details about, about it and how uh, we can better appreciate its uh, influence in uh, the way we celebrate Easter. So I've put together a PowerPoint presentation to outline these uh, interesting points. Passover, we recognize that as being the Israelites' uh, door with the blood over the, on the lintels and over the over headpiece. Exodus 12, 39, it's a reminder of the day they were hastily delivered from Egypt. That's the meaning of the Passover. Exodus 12, 17 through 19. This festival will be celebrated as an ordinance forever. Gill, a noteworthy commentary in the 1800s, interpreted this to mean that until the Jewish economy would end or until Messiah comes. Because, uh, of course, whenever the term forever is used in scripture, we uh, it's, it's usually uh, interpreted as meaning to time indefinite. In other words, an, it's an indefinite period of time. It's not everlasting uh, as uh, we might believe it to be. Messiah Jesus did come and the Passover celebration was fulfilled in him. He became the lamb that is prefigured by the Passover. And we commemorate this when we partake of communion. Exodus 12, 26, the Israelites were commanded to tell their children about this. Exodus 13, 8, and you shall tell your son on that day, saying, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Psalm 78, the story is being told by the fathers to the sons as they received it. So we see that uh, in Psalms, it fulfills, in a sense, what was being commanded. Uh, and this particular story is even being told today in Jewish communities. Acts 7. This is the same story Stephen told those who were about to stone him. And of course, it's still the same story being told today in Jewish circles. And we even tell this story when we discuss uh, the communion or the events surrounding Easter. Passover, when is it celebrated? It's celebrated on Nisan 14. Now this is a kind of a complicated display trying to show you how Nisan 14 is determined. The spring new moon is what we call the first day of Nisan. Here you see uh, depicted the various phases of the moon in fast motion. And of course, when it's all dark, that's a new moon. And then when it's all full, that's a full moon like we see here over on the 15th. And uh, so you have the first day of Nisan and the 15th day of Nisan. Genesis 1.14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons, festivals, and days and years. In other words, God uh, put into motion schedules or sequences in the skies, in the heavens that would allow his followers, uh, the Jews, to be able to determine when the festival should be celebrated. They didn't necessarily have to keep a calendar uh, written down because they would see it uh, broadcast in the heavens. So Exodus 12, 1 and 2, and 13 and 8, Abib, which was the month, uh, a month in... Um, the Jewish calendar, and we call that Nisan, was to be the first 
new first month of the year. Up until that time, Tishri was the first month. Well, it still is the first month of the um, secular year, but of the religious year, Nisan was the first month. And that was the instruction given to the Israelites or to Moses at Exodus 12, one and two. This little interesting uh, illustration here showing how you can determine how many degrees the sun moves per hour. And of course it moves, uh, it moves 15 degrees, but how can you determine 15 degrees just by looking at it? Well, if you hold your fingers up like that, um, and you look at that in the heavens, that particular distance marks off approximately 15 degrees. And so the sun will probably move that much every, uh, every hour. And if you start at the horizon and go up from the horizon and try to copy that till you get to the sun, you can tell how long the sun has been Okay, on the 10th day of Nisan, they were to select a lamb. Then on the 14th day, they were to sacrifice that lamb. And so how do we determine when that would occur? Exodus 12, 2, Nisan was to be their first month from then on and here it shows what they call the spring equinox. The spring equinox is when the day and the nights are equal. New moon closest to the spring equinox was to be when uh, Nisan would start. Well, the summer solstice, as we see it here, is the longest day of the year. The winter solstice is the shortest day of the year. And the equinox is when the day and the nights are equal in length. March 21st and 22nd on our calendar is usually when the spring equinox occurs. Every year we can depend on that. And the actual celestial mechanics, of course, um, would select whether it's the 21st or the 22nd of March. Equinox means equal day, equal night, and equal day at the equator. It won't quite be the same at our latitudes, but it will be equal at the equator. Here we have a picture of, of unblemished lamb. Passover instructions. Unblemished lamb to be sacrificed. Exodus 12.3. On the 10th of Nisan, each household was to select a lamb, which also means a goat. Exodus 12.4. Small households should combine to share in eating the sacrifice because they didn't want to waste uh, the meal. And so if you're a small household or maybe a poor household, you could combine with another household to uh, share in the sacrifice. Later, the custom came, became 10 people per lamb. Uh, that was uh, a custom they did just determined by um, experience. Exodus 12, 6. Inspect the, the animal for defects until the 14th day, then sacrifice it. The lamb was to be taken into the house and, and uh, kept apart. And, and, and actually, the family became uh, close to the little lamb during this period of time. And then on the 14th day, despite the Grief that might cause some of the children, of course, they were to sacrifice. Exodus 12, 46, it was very important that no bones were to be broken. And we know how this was uh, later significant with regard to the sacrifice of Jesus. Moses Maimonides, I think that's the way you pronounce it, Maimonides. He identified 50 disqualifying blemishes of lamb. He lived from 1135 to 1204 and was a very famous uh, philosopher and, and um, uh, rabbi of the Jewish faith. And many times uh, you'll see a 
are here in Maimonides being quoted for something significant. Um, and it's interesting to know that he identified 50 disqualifying issues, whereas in Leviticus 21, 16 through 14, God identifies only 12 blemishes that disqualifies the priest from serving, but they never uh, looked into or they never gave you the number of blemishes for a lamb. Hebrews 7, 17, Jesus, who is our high priest, is free from any blemish like Melchizedek. So Jesus was a perfect lamb without any blemishes. Paul says Jesus is our perfect Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Exodus 12, 5. On the 14th day, the lamb is slain between the two evenings. Oh, well, what does that mean, between the two evenings? Between the two evenings, first evening started at noon, second evening started at sunset. And so in between these two, is when the lamb should be slain. Traditionally, the lamb was slain about 3 p.m. in time to prepare it for the Passover meal that was uh, that evening on the 15th. Remember their day started at six o'clock in the evening. And so the lamb was slain on the 14th day. It was to be eaten on the 15th day, which was uh, starting at sunset. Exodus 12, 43, 45, foreigners, temporary residents, or hired hands cannot participate. Exodus 12, 44, 46, and 48. If circumcised, slaves and alien residents can participate. Exodus 12, 48. No uncircumcised male may eat of the sacrifice. Passover instructions. Splash lamb's blood on the door frame. Exodus 12, 7, splash blood on the sides and top of the door frame. Exodus 12, 8, that night, the roasted meat along with bitter herbs and unleavened bread is to be eaten. Remember, after sundown was the next day or Nisan 15. Exodus 12, 10, meat not eaten must be destroyed by burning. Entire lambs sustains people, which is markedly different because a portion is usually given to God. You know, when you offer a sacrifice in the temple, you don't eat, you, you sometimes or oftentimes eat a portion of it uh, with the priest or with your family. But the other portion is given to God, which is usually uh, the priest's portion, which they eat uh, when, when uh, they have their meal. Exodus 12, 11. The meal is to be eaten in haste, and people are to be ready to travel with possessions in the morning. That would be the morning of the 15th. Here's a um, picture, a wood carving, of a picture by Charles Foster um, in 1897. And you see the, the uh, garb of the people inside, you see placed in it is in a more modern setting because when the Passover uh, angel came by it was uh, not and they weren't dressed like that. Exodus 12 12 Nisan 15 God sends the destroying angel. Exodus 12 8 the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. It's kind of an interesting comment there. The term plague is used uh, in this translation, the NIV, and that's an accurate rendition. Uh, we wonder how did the angel kill the firstborn in Egypt? And it seems as if there was some sort of sickness that uh, quickly 
overtook them and uh, resulted in a fatal, uh, a fatal disease. Strong's uh, translation or Strong's uh, translation says that the term negath means plague figuratively, figuratively an inflection of disease, an infliction of disease or stumbling. But plague is the, the word that uh, is used in the NIV. Exodus 12, 8. But the blood on the, your house will be a special sign. When I see the blood, I will pass over your house. I will cause bad things to happen to the people of Egypt. But none of these bad diseases will hurt you. Exodus 12, 14. Israelites commanded to celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance. And we mentioned that, that it was to be celebrated until uh, Messiah comes. And so today it's still being celebrated in Jewish, Jewish homes. Exodus 12, 29, and the Lord's angels smote all the Egyptian firstborn that night. Exodus 12, 30, that night, a great cry went up throughout the land. Exodus 12, 31. The Israelites immediately started gathering their possessions. 12, 35 and 36. God inclined the Egyptian people to be favorable and give the Israelites valuable gifts and provisions for their journey. Exodus 15, 13 and 14. This event was prophesied 400 years earlier, saying they will leave all kinds with all kinds of valuable things. Exodus 12, 51. On that very day, the Israelites left Egypt. That was Nisan 15. They left Egypt that morning um, on the 15th of Nisan. The Passover fulfillment. Now we'll review some information regarding how the Passover uh, was fulfilled in Christ. First, we'd like to resolve some problems. John and Luke's apparent conflict. In Luke 22, 7 and 8, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be slain. Okay, that was on the 14th of Nisan. The Passover lamb had to be slain on this day. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare for us the Passover meal that we may eat it tonight. See, that's in Luke 22, 7 and 8. They're going to eat the meal that night on Nisan 14, according to Luke. So according to Luke, Jesus celebrated the Passover on the evening that the Passover lamb was slain, which was normal. They would celebrate it on the, or they would slay it on the 14th and, and eat it on the 15th. On the evening that the Passover lamb was slain. John, however, says in 1828, and then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium. And it was early. Now this is after the they ate the uh, evening meal or they ate the uh, um, communion supper, the last supper. They, the Jews themselves, did not enter the praetorium that they might not be defiled or become ceremonially unclean, but might be fit to eat the Passover. Well, right away we see a problem here because we know that. Jesus ate the Passover before he was taken prisoner. But now these uh, ones that were there, the Jews that were there, were still going to eat the Passover at a later date. According to John, Jesus died before the Passover was celebrated by the Jews. Note, they would not enter the Praetorium the day Jesus died. For fear of defiling themselves before they ate the Passover meal after sundown that evening. So there is 
apparent, an apparent conflict here. Now the solution to John's apparent time conflict. The traditional view is that Jesus was executed on a Friday. Only April 30th and, 30, and 33 in AD qualify for a Friday on the uh, on Nisan 14. To distinguish Christian Easter from Jewish Passover, the weekday was chosen over the date. That's just an interesting comment. In other words, the normal day is determined by the full moon, as we've discovered. But in Christian uh, circles, they did not want to have their Easter celebration the same day as the Jewish Passover. And so they chose a weekday, a Sunday, as opposed to, uh, I'm sorry, Saturday, as opposed to um, the actual date for Jesus' sacrifice. There are two different theories regarding how this may have worked out. The two calendar Essene versus the temple dating system. On April 7th, 30 CE, two calendars separated by one day as shown. This is the uh, temple calendar, and this is the Essene calendar. The Essenes were a sect in Egypt or in Israel that we'll talk about a little more about later. The upper room is thought to be in the Essene quarter in Jerusalem. So here you see that um, there's a day difference between when the Essenes would have observed Passover and the uh, temple priests would have observed Passover. You can see it right here. The Essene calendar is one day early. After Babylon, the Babylonian release by Cyrus, Jewish people became dispersed. Temple made allowances by allowing two consecutive days for Passover sacrifice. Josephus estimates that there were over 250,000 lambs slain at Passover. Mark 12, 14, 12, the day the lambs for the Passover meal were killed, Jesus' disciples asked him, Josephus states, the Essenes, along with the Sadducees and Pharisees, were the three principal sects in Israel, associated with the Dead Sea Scroll community. That's what the um, Essenes were, associated with the Dead Sea Scroll community. They were noted for baptizing. Here we have sort of a uh, picture of delineating the various uh, locations in the um, city of Jerusalem at that time. The upper city is in yellow. King Herod's palace, you can see where that's uh, denoted. The approximate location of the home of the high priest, there it is in the upper city. The Essene community is uh, outlined in red and the approximate location of the upper room that they uh, ate the uh, Last Supper, and the Essene, or Valley Gate. Essene Gate rediscovered by archaeologist Bargel Pixner in 1977. The Gate of the Essenes, there you see it. Ritual Baths, this was important because the Essenes were a baptizing sect, and they had a, uh, were constantly had men running from the uh, ritual baths to the uh, Essene quarters. There's the outline of the Essene quarter. And this area has been determined to be the Essene section, which later became the Christian section. And there is believed to be the upper room. Interesting question. Was Judas present during communion? Many people wonder about that. Did Judas partake in the Lord's evening or last supper. We can find out by making comparison of the scriptures involved in, in uh, the discussion. For instance, 
here, John seems to have the best sequential uh, descriptions. You see, these are these are the five different elements of the uh, uh, events that occurred that night. And John has five: twenty-one, twenty-six, twenty-seven, thirty-one. So there's a sequence there. Um, but the rest of the Bible writers don't have that. And we'll look at, look at that a little bit. The feet washing, uh, only John records that. The betrayal, they all record it. And so there's a certain agreement there. Dip the song. All but Luke record that. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a song when I have dipped it. He gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. And so only John des describes when Judas left. Only Luke's order is in disagreement. John's order outlines the facts pretty well. Uh, Judas, or Luke, has C2219. And then here he has the betrayal at 2221, which is after communion. So uh, what do we have to say about that? Well, Luke wasn't actually present at the supper. All the other writers were present except for Mark. However, it's agreed by commentators that Mark was Peter's secretary and wrote his observations. Uh, and so we can assume that the other writers did particularly um, keep the order uh, somewhat, although they had omissions. But Luke was in disagreement, but he wasn't there. And so let's assume that Luke just didn't order the events right, because, you know, he was telling, uh, writing the record based on testimony he had uh, been given by various observers. So it can be concluded that Judas wasn't present during the Last Supper. Passover fulfillment, this will be continued next week. Thank you very much for uh, participating tonight. I hope that you'll be here next week when we have another continuation of this subject.